Welcome. Thank you for joining. We are very excited to talk about this subject with all of you uh, in the midst of pandemic kayak life. Uh, as I mentioned, disclaimer at the top, we're going to record this webinar and put it on YouTube later. So if you're not okay with your face potentially popping up during this webinar, please hide your video. Um, but to get started, let's yeah, so our topic is kind of the soft skills, soft skills side of group and incident management and leadership, uh, building leadership skills as a paddler, building confidence in your skills and communication to lead. And, uh, you know, as us and the experts we got with us here talked about this, sometimes this can often be a hurdle that many women coaches or leaders face in paddle sports, but regardless of gender, uh, we think a lot of folks kind of feel this way. So we're really excited to, to discuss tangible strategies that paddlers looking to step into more leadership roles with their group or to teach others, perform rescues with their pod, can kind of learn about and gain that education for themselves. Um, so if you guys joined our last webinar, you already know these format tidbits, but if you are new, um, everybody here in the webinar is force muted except us, the facilitators, and our experts who we're going to introduce in a second here. Um, we have a couple questions that were submitted ahead of time. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please use the live chat tool with Zoom. And Henry and I here, uh, this is Henry, my name is Pauline. Uh, we'll be monitoring that and can revisit questions at the end. We have about 10 or 15 minutes saved for Q&A. Um, there are some links and awesome images and resources in this uh, PowerPoint that we'll be referring to. Um, afterwards, we're going to send an email to Buzz with links and all those references, so don't worry if you don't catch everything. Um, and I think that's about it for the format. So, Henry, if you want to introduce our expert panelists today. Sure. Uh, so, we have three panelists. Here they are all from the Letter Coast. Um, no. <laughs> there's no, they're not. first Laura. She's an ACA L5 coach. Um, I think everyone here knows her. She was vice president of Bass Glass for years, so she's a really big advocate, obviously for the club. We also have um, Ashley Brown from Charleston, who is also a ACA Level Five coach and does a lot of teaching at the university and showing. Um, students how to become leaders and finally we have Dale Williams from Georgia um, who is also who is an ACA L5 instructor trainer educator which is the highest um, ranking or uh, certification that ACA has um, Dale and Ashley are both on the committee for determining what we all learned um, from our coaches so they're there, there. If you have a bone to pick about the curriculum that <laughs> people are teaching, these are the people that you want to send an email to. I think there's a couple of other coaches in the Bay Area that are also on that, but um, they're they're both really uh, really influential in the paddling community, and we're really lucky to have them here. Yeah, definitely appreciate all your guys' time. Thank you so much for joining us. So we want to proceed to the next slide. Dale is going to get us started. Well, thanks for having me. It's, uh, this is a really interesting subject to tackle, particularly since there's you know, some contrast between um, uh, Basque's model of a, of a, co it's a common adventure model, I would call it. I, I think where there's not a specific leader or not an assigned leader. Um, and, uh, and sort of the ACA model where everything is based around in a, the development of, a, of an assigned leader. Um, so we were asked to uh, tell a story that might uh, provide a starting point for discussion. Uh, each of us have some stories. I, I think uh, uh, mine is probably the least interesting, but, uh, but, but it kind of builds on, uh, it sets the foundation, I think, for what everybody else uh, will have a chance to add to. So uh, my story has to do with a young woman named Sarah, who I met in Alaska. Uh, while teaching an L4 
trip leader program, which, uh, which is a, it's, a, it's a course in the ACA, uh, uh, an assessment course uh, that's all about leadership. And so, you know, it, it has, uh, it's, it's, it's similar to our L5 instructor certification in that that's its primary focus is, is leadership. Uh, the instructor bit adds coaching, but, uh, but in both cases, what we do is take turns leading. So people are assigned a period of time where, where they lead. And this particular group had uh, people in their mm, late 30s through late 40s, all professionals uh, or managers in their field. Uh, they paddled together often, they knew each other. It was a good group, they're very supportive, uh, high emotional as well as intellectual intelligence, good communicators, uh, and, uh, and as I say, very supportive of, of one another. Sarah did not know any of these people. Uh, she was a recent, well, she'd been working for Knowles for two years. Uh, and she was half their age. I'm, I'm not sure exactly of Sarah's age, but I think probably 24 or 25 at the most. So, so roughly half the age of, the, of the, the, the senior of that group. As we ran through the leadership exercises, everybody did okay, but Sarah did great. She hit the ball out of the park every time she was given the, the assignment to lead, when it was her time to lead. And so I came away asking myself how that was, what happened? Who taught Sarah so much about how to lead? And, and I think part of the answer is just, you know, some of that's just Sarah, it's, it's her life experiences growing up. But, but, I, but there's not much I could learn from that personally. So, so I went uh, after the Knowles end of it just to see what, uh, what they had to offer. And I asked Sarah to send me a copy of their manual, which I have included for you. And basically it has seven points guidelines for leadership and four styles of leadership. And uh, I won't bore you with uh, all of those. You can all read and, uh, and review them yourselves, but uh, but what they boiled down to in terms of how I use that now for L5 uh, instructor certification is as follows, and I will read this paragraph to you. Uh, when assessing a candidate at this level, our primary emphasis should be on their ability to function as an asset to the group where leading or following. Um, do they contribute to the planning and decision-making process in a positive way? Are they aware and responsive to the direction of the group leaders? Do they accept the leadership role when necessary and support others in their time or turn to lead? In essence, are they team players? When assessing hard skills, we should be most concerned with their ability to keep up with the group, to stay upright or recover quickly when they do capsize. They should have good spatial awareness, be able to maintain a safe position that is close enough to assist when needed uh, and to communicate visually. They should be able to maneuver effectively to take advantage of features, avoid obstacles, and to assist others. Uh, in essence, you know, if, you, if you've got all that down, I, you know, the question in my mind is, do you need an assigned leader? So the real difference between what you know, we do regularly and what you may do with, uh, in, in your model is, is just, it just comes down to that assignment because in our model, the, the, it's set up for the leader to change throughout the process, throughout the exercise, um, different lengths of time. But, so does anybody have any uh, fellow experts, any comments or things that they would like to add to that? Questions from the audience? There's when, no. when you, oh, go ahead. Oh, just when, um, when you were describing and when you read that was from the L5 uh, instructor certification criteria, correct? It's actually a, a piece that I send out to instructor trainer candidates. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's, it's, it's just something that I, yeah, those are my words. Um, 
that would have been sent to Sean when he was assessing for IT. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's what I want him to look for. It's a suggested wording in the new uh, development of the, there's new criteria being developed for the instructor, uh, uh, the L5 assessor um, certification. And so that's suggested wording for that as well. Yeah, what, what really um, that reminded me of is the, the mnemonic CLAP that we cite a lot. I know you all like acronyms. <laughs> No, I like <laughs> aphorisms better. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, just the P, especially in in CLAP, and just keeping that as a group management mindset. It's kind of like CLAP is not just a reminder, but it's a, a way of thinking and being on the water that you you wear and you make it a part of you when you're you're paddling together. Especially the P of like position of maximum usefulness. So. Whether there's a designated leader or not, that's just what struck me. You're always thinking and assessing and being aware of where you're most useful in support or, you know, setting safety or getting out of the way <laughs> in some situations. Yeah. I mean, I think the Knowles uh, version of uh, expedition behavior, although, I mean, it's covering a lot more activities than just kayaking, sort of sets the, that same tone. and. Uh, Pauline, you had you had a question. You had four questions that were sent in. Uh, could you read those again? Yeah, I did have one question from someone who said, uh, "What is the best way how to receive and give feedback from and to fellow paddlers pre-incident?" So I think. Uh, I think that Laura is going to cover this again in her example, uh, and probably Ashley will too, but a lot of that has to do with getting permission ahead of time, setting the rules for feedback with one another ahead of time. Uh, and the example that I'd given to Pauline was one where, where people agreed to uh, encourage and accept feedback by not responding in any way except, thank you for your feedback. You know no explanations no excuses no no assumption that the final word was your response uh, uh, or that if you didn't respond that that was the final word so you know you accept feedback as if it's somebody's opinion not the final word accept or reject internally and thank them for their feedback that makes it a lot easier for everybody so planning ahead of time is, is the answer to that i guess coming to an agreement about how you do that Going off of kind of what you're saying, um, one of the key skills in the Knowles leadership thing that is competence, although it's not really there. there. And I guess one of my questions is, is when you're in an incident like this and you're not necessarily being the designated leader, how do you just, how do you show the designated leader? Um, how do you act, how do you show the designated leader that you're an active follower and that you have competence in a certain skill? For instance, in a rescue or in a in a particular rescue or something, so they can use your skills best in a high stress situation. Just so I'm not answering all the questions, Ashley or Laura. I give you a shot at that. I'm happy to answer it. Um, I I think that competence is is ob is obvious to a large degree, and if you're the closest to a rescue and you say I've got it and you get it, you know you're showing your competence. I I don't think that um, people ha would have an expectation that the leader would be the one to do the rescue or to assign a. Re I mean, if you were doing a training where you're like, now it's your turn, but if there was a legitimate rescue, the person closest to that would perform the rescue if they were competent. So I don't know that uh, that some sort of a statement of competence makes much sense. Just be competent. I don't know. That was, that was not, <laughs> not, not, yeah. not answer. I, I think that's a good answer. I, I think, um, you know, in keeping with understanding who you're with and what your, you know, what your agreement is on how you'll, you're going to conduct whatever this uh, activity is that you do. 
is important. Uh, so if I were to, to go, if, if I was going to go paddling with a group of people and it was anything but uh, the absolute lowest of challenges ahead, I would want to know who they were, what their skills were, what their acceptable level of risk was, what they perceived to be uh, risk, um, and what they hoped to accomplish from the day. So the, the more I know about them, the better. I, I mean, at some point you gotta go paddling, but, but, it's, uh, but I think it's important to understand people's capabilities and expectations uh, as much as possible ahead of time. So, yeah, good question, good point. Um, we could kind of segue this further into the next slide or the next section that we're gonna talk about. Ashley can kind of take it over. Okay, hi everyone. Thanks so much for um, joining us. I'm really excited to be here. This is really fun um, and I appreciate you having me. Um, so I'm gonna start with why would why would you lead? Why would you want to be a leader and make this decision to move forward? And it's, um, and it's about expanding your personal skills and it's, and it's in, the, in the progress of your personal skills, which when you get, first get in the kayak, all you can see is what you can do. You can't see past the end of your kayak is a lot of what people say. And so my own ability to keep up with the group or to um, turn my boat so I can't see past my, the end of my boat. And then I start to be able to see um, other boats. And then I get to see the conditions around me, whether the wind is blowing um, me off course or anything like that. And, and I'm starting to see current conditions. So I'm starting to stack these things up. And, um, <clears throat> and then I can start to predict the future or start to predict behaviors. I can start to see what the skills of my co-paddlers are and um and when somebody potentially capsizes i can respond to that quickly because now i can see what they're up to so my my ability to be a part of this group is growing um so when you really start to put together this entire adventure you can begin to be uh, of service to the group so if you think of leadership as serving the group where let's say you're the sweep and if you're a good communicator you can make sure that the group doesn't get too spread out or that they take breaks because somebody's having a struggle in from the back or if you're close to a rescue like the example we just had you're the first one to the rescue um so if you as you serve you're leading and and um similar to what the Knowles process is it's when you're part of a group and you're an active cooperative part of the group you're serving the group and in the service is the leadership so people come to count on you and then as you get better at predicting where the compression of the current is and how to get across that um they 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 look to you because you've you've gained this knowledge and you've assisted others so having the knowledge right so have you you've gained this knowledge there's this compression of current at this one place that makes it really tough to cross or to attain or whatever um why would you keep it right why would you keep that secret or not share it or, or serve the group serve the community by helping people use this this information to cross this part of the channel or wherever you are um so so why would you want to lead because it's the next level of paddling. So you're, you've got your strokes, you've got your rescues, you understand the weather and the current and the wind and the wind direction, and then you're gonna share that and use it and, and engage in the entire adventure. So I started with why lead and now I'm going to switch to my story. Um, we had a, we had a, a project so it was a sort of a meetup group and we were going over the horizon so we were going three miles out to sea to find a particular buoy so we couldn't see it from shore you know we could see it on a chart we knew where we were headed <clears throat> and so it was a navigation exercise and um we we had a pretty solid core of people and a couple of people that we had references for but didn't know 
Um, so we took off and about a mile in, you know what? Let me press pause for a second and back up. What I want you guys to do is written here on the, the screen, it's how could we have made better choices and where and what were the good decisions, okay? So, so I'm telling you the over the horizon story and I want you to think about where we made, where we made not great choices and where we made pretty good choices, all right? So now I'll go back to the story. We've taken off, we've launched out and we're headed towards our buoy in the middle of nowhere. And um, <clears throat> about a mile in, one of the paddlers is really slowing down and not really keeping up with the, the group. And um, there was, a, there was a, some, com some communication about it. Should we turn back? Should we send one person back with him? Should we, you know, we, we had some communication and, and the person that was the planner decided that we would just carry on and uh, press on. And so as we time-wise should have been at about three miles, the, the person that was really slowing the group down was fully kitten paws. Do you guys say that? Um, where they're just barely patting the water, you know, it's just like, like a kitten, you know, it's just a little pat, 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 pat. He wasn't making any headway and, um, and it, he just couldn't keep up. So, so another poor participant in the group goes and, and says, we're going to put you on a tow and hooks him up to the tow, gets um, someone else to, to hold him upright. And, um, and we decide that we need to return. So we didn't find our buoy in the middle of nowhere. And, and now we've got to return. Now, if you go to the next slide, um, I'll show you this. So this is a really complicated, no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> this, so we, we, launched from, we launched from the number one and we intended to go essentially straight out to see for the purposes of this story. Um, but with that longshore current, as you can see, we were probably in halfway between number one and number two, but we were past the horizon line so we could see a water tower, but we really couldn't see the shoreline, right? So we knew essentially where we are by the water tower, so we were heading in. But you can see that we had, well, so the conditions had, were pretty big. They were probably four foot swells, 15 knots of wind, and the swells were causing a lot of drag with the tow, right? So we took the tow, um, we were trying to tow back from straight above the word beach towards the number one. Well, it wasn't going well. The people that were not on tow could make some headway, but the other people, the people that were involved in the tow, so it was the tower, the victim, and then a support person. They were not making headway at all. So we tried to switch out um, some people to make it a little more efficient. It wasn't getting, it wasn't getting better. So we, what we did was we made a decision to turn with the longshore current and go towards the number two, right? So that, that was the plan. Right? So there were seven people to start with, and we sent two towards the number one, and the rest of the five stayed together to go to the number two. We had VHF radios and we could communicate, right? Well, the two that went towards the two paddlers that were going to go get a car to meet them at the other end of the island, one of them, guess what? Got a little queasy. Got a little seasick, right? So, yes, exactly. So, um, so the, the situation there becomes a bit of a problem because if you have ever had a seasick person, they often in their processing of the seasickness <laughs> um, can't stay upright. So there was a delay, the, um, the two held, held together and uh, worked it out for a bit. And ultimately this hero controlled the seasick enough to, to make it to the number one. Um, so without a tow, without uh, um, 
someone holding them up. So anyway, we end up with the two going to the number one, being fine and making it, and then the five going to the number two. They had quite a long distance, but if they just sat still and stayed pretty much intact, the, the, that longshore current was gonna push them to where they needed to be. And particularly once they got closer to shore, they were gonna be able to see their location even if they had to backtrack it was a little bit. Um, what happened then was, so we, we live at, so Charleston's a beachy community and there was, there were a lot of swimmers at the beach that day. So the victim, there was no sending this victim in to paddle past a bunch of swimmers. It was very dangerous. So the victim got out of his boat and swam in. The, um, the people that were independent of the tow landed. The, rest, the, the support person or the nurse was, was holding the empty boat and um, the tower landed the boat, got out of his boat, swam back out and got in the victim's boat and then landed the victim's boat. So, <laughs> end of the story, everybody's fine, everybody's landed, we chummed the water a little bit, and, um, and but, but everybody got home safely. So, um, I think that that is, um, got a lot of points where we could have made different decisions some of the decisions that we made were good. Some of the decisions we made could have been altered. <laughs> so I'm, I'm curious if anyone had any feedback for where was a decision you would have done something different? Did I, I don't know, Dale and Laura or um, Pauline or does any of the let me, other let me, let me start with a very simple question from the very end. Why did the tower uh, swim back out to land the a victim's boat rather than just towing the empty boat to shore. Wouldn't that have been much easier? Um, it was on a long rope and there were swimmers everywhere. It would have been easier had the beach been empty. But there were, um, well, you know, it was a beach swim thing. And most of the time, I don't know how it is where you are, but most of the time people that are dancing around in the water don't really care what the boats are doing. And don't really realize a 17 foot boat hitting them in the head is going to be a problem. You know, they're not getting out of our way. So it was a snake and in, yeah. I'm curious about the navigational planning. Was this longshore current and the large swells and the wind, was that a surprise? Or? No. No, we knew. So, um, so, when so the reason we didn't get to our location was because of the victim. But we had to change. The plans were altered by, a, you know, a human need. Okay. Um, um, we were also moving a lot slower than our plan had stood for. Had. Do you yeah. question the decision to split the group in two just to get a car? You know, two and sending off only two people and not three. That the decision, I think, the decision would have been sounder. That's exactly the one I was looking for to get three. Um, the decision to send three would have been a better decision. Um, this was at a time before Uber, so, and and we were in, and we were in, um, we're, we're in a beach community. I mean, there's no taxi. It's not. There's no public transport. It was it would have been an eight mile walk or. Somebody calling their mom. I don't so, know. So Ashley, say again how many there was a total of seven people? Seven. Yeah. Yeah. And and how many of those were uh uh referred but not known to the core group again? Three. And uh and in that three, did that include the person who was the uh Lily Lily dipping? I'm sorry, cat pawing. Yes. And, and the person who got seasick? The, the, the Lily Dipper was this, oh, oh, actually, the seasick person with the two was, yep. a, was, um, was one of the four, was one of the core group. That was unexpected. The Lily Dipper, the toe E was a referred person. Yeah. I, I so interrupted I, Roger. I think you had a, 
something else to ask, Roger. So uh, I have another question why when they realized they uh, weren't going to be able to get back to the beach while towing, why didn't they uh, do an inline tow? They had enough people to um, add a couple and uh, get everybody to shore safely, I would think. They did. Um, uh, it was, it was, hmm. Well, there were, there were a couple of problems. Uh, one of the people that was capable of towing was the nurse. And he was in, he really felt like he couldn't not be the nurse. Um, the, the, there was another person whose tow belt was in a back hatch. And, and that was not a great place to have a tow belt. This, the, the seas, the way that they were that day, you couldn't, um, there wasn't any opening hatches that would have filled with water. Um, but that, that's uh, what, what we call not having a tow belt. Yeah, exactly. Why would you bring it? Exactly. Yes. This is many years ago, right, Ashley? This is many years ago, but also, Dale, like, when you go on an adventure like this and someone is doing a, a project, you know, you're respectful, you, you you respect, you're respectful of their leadership role, right? And it, it's a cooperative, right? But, but to, to then step in and say, or if you're, if you're sort of asking, hey, Ashley, why, why didn't you do something different? It wasn't my project. Does that make sense? Well, so was this a so common Ashley, issue? May... I'm... Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Dale. I was just going to say, was there an assigned leader for this group, or was it? Uh... There was a um, an assume. There was a. It was uh, so. It was somebody who was, was. Yeah, it wasn't assigned. I mean, he, he chose to do it. He he designed it. Oh, okay. He, okay. Yeah, it was. Yeah. And it and uh, you That's know it turns out. Go ahead. Oh, that, well, that kind of leads into a question that Henry and I had in this scenario is when the paddlers split off into the two people going to uh, point one in the image on screen, like who or how was that decision made of how to like split up the group in that way and how to accommodate um, the person who was struggling and the person who was seasick? That is a really excellent question. This has been a number of years ago. Um, Well, okay, so the best if you, if you, I was gonna say, if you forget, like in that scenario, because it was long ago, if you have a similar scenario much more recently, and like there was kind of a splitting off to address multiple needs, like how is that decision making kind of thought through? Um, honestly, I cannot recall a splitting off since then, <laughs> so um, yeah. It, it was a, it was a, it was a tough decision to make, but I, I admit, I was trying to say participants and all that through the whole thing, but I'll tell you that in, in the one decision, I said, you guys quit fighting this current, go with it. I'm going to get the car. And then I was planning mm -hmm. on going by myself and somebody said, I'll go with you so you don't go alone. And then he got sick. So that was a liability. It was. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, if it's yeah, um, go ahead. yeah, this is Franca. Uh, hey, Franca. Uh, so, hi. How are you? Hi. <laughs> so, um, my question is: uh, You said the paddler that was uh, basically struggling uh, is start clearly to struggle one mile into the. Uh, trip, the buoy was three miles away. I think that, you know, uh, personally, I think uh, if that person is struggling one mile into the trip and, and you are not even uh, one sixth of the trip, uh, that probably uh, that person needs to go back. On the nose, Franca. Absolutely on the nose. Absolutely. Sometimes your leader says, we're going to do this. And since they've chosen to lead, you have chosen to follow and so we did that and um i agree with you that is exactly the right decision we could have taken him back and started over it would have been fine 
If you're the weaker paddler, if you're the paddler that's tied one mile, how do you go, uh, this plan doesn't work for me at this point, and also get help from, from the group to kind of help you get better? So Henry, um, I, you kind of broke up at the first part. What was the first part? If you're the, the kitten, if you're the slow paddler? Who, yeah, if you're the, the slow paddler, or you're hearing maybe a new plan that isn't working for you, that you don't think will work for you because you're tired or something like that, how do you, how do you, how do you speak up and say, you know, this doesn't work for me and here's why without being um, a jerk? Um, well, I'm just such a jerk to start with, so it just, come, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I think, I think, gosh, communicate, use your big girl words, you know, just talk. It, it, um, I, you know, people step into things that they aren't, they don't understand what they're in and to say, hey, listen. I'm out. I don't get this. It's not a bad thing to do. It's in fact a gift to the group. It really is. And if somebody's, I, I like to have, um, I like to have a conversation where if somebody in the beginning of any sort of a group where if somebody offers you a tow, they think you need a tow. So accept the tow. Just let's just all stand around and agree to that before anything else. Nobody needs to be a hero. If somebody offers you a tow, you go, okay, yeah, thanks. I'm going to take your tow, right? Um, when you, what, when you're observing your own performance, you can just communicate with somebody else. If, if, if on the flip side, if you're trying to communicate with somebody else that they're not doing well, you know, I think that leading them to it, how do you feel? Are you, worried that everybody's faster, you know what I mean? Like, not like that, but are you, um, are you concerned about this sort of situation? What do you see in the, in the conditions that you see right now? And um, so, um, I don't know, did that even remotely answer your question? No, no that was, that was really good feedback. Uh, I think that was a great topic to kind of cover in that scenario. Um, I think we'll proceed okay. onward to, I, uh, I think we're gonna, um, um, to, in, in direct response to, to Henry's question, um, I believe that uh, we cannot put the responsibility um, to assess the situation and that, that that person is in over their head uh, to that person alone. Obviously, if somebody gets slow after only a mile, they must be a very inexperienced paddler. Um, and uh, the, the rest of the group really must take the lead on telling, on telling them, like Ashley just said, talking to them, hey, how are you feeling about that? And uh, um, don't you think um, we should change plans or something like that? The, the responsibility, I don't think, can be with that person alone because they, don't have, they, they, they just can't assess their own ability. Exactly, exactly. They yeah. don't know what they don't know. Yeah, yeah well said, thank you. Um, let's move on to slide six. We're going to toss the baton to Laura and hear about an example from her and its relationship to building leadership. <laughs> yeah, so uh, there were uh, a lot of examples slash incidents um, in my paddling development that I could look to, <laughs> but this one really stands out just because um, all of the learnings were, were really honed for me and, and brought home during this event. Um, but this happened uh, during a trip to Taiwan that a lot of folks here know um, Kelly Marie Henry, and she and I did this trip together. And our goal was not only to paddle from Kanding to this fishing village called Nanfangao, um, but we also wanted to teach a series of classes before. Um, and the classes were great, and we ended up making close friendships with a lot of our students. Um, and they had varying degrees of paddling skill, skill level and ability. Um, but uh, as we started our journey, we got a lot of requests to join us at certain points. Um, and I guess in hindsight, naively, we said yes. <laughs> 
but we were so excited um, to have, you know, friends that wanted to join us, um, especially local Taiwanese who could help us navigate um, a lot of these different areas, especially uh, culturally and linguistically, that we were that we were really delighted that they wanted to join. Um, the problem was the conditions throughout the entire trip were always windier than expected, bigger than expected. Um, the beach is always a little bit more trafficked than expected <laughs> in some areas. So it it became apparent that we were not just having someone join us, but we were becoming responsible for another person. Um, mm -hmm. And normally that wouldn't be too much of an issue, but given that we were still learning how to be responsible for ourselves in a new environment, um, added a, an extra level of, of challenge. Um, but we, we worked through and in hindsight, it's hard to say I would make a, a different decision just because it was so great to continue uh, that bonding and getting to know so many, so many people that we met on this trip. But it just so happened that the last day of our expedition ended up having the stormiest and biggest conditions. Um, and so this is what you see in the photos here. Uh, this is a really cool outcropping on the East Coast, uh, about six miles south of the fishing village that was our, our destination for the day and the end of our expedition, that's Nambangao. And the island that you see, I forget the name of it, but it's actually a continuation of a fault line. Um, there's several different fault lines that go through. So this area is, this part of the coast is shifting and changing all the time. And there are a lot of cool caves that are near this rock outcropping. Um, but the exposure is that on the left side of this rock outcropping, it's usually bigger waves, more expanse, less protection. And then on the right side, there's kind of like a sneaky entrance that often, um, that often you can you know, bypass any sort of large waves and swell. Um, and it has some wind protection as well. So on this final day, and this is a photo taken by our friend Nyo from his boat <laughs> on our paddle back, um, a group of, I believe, seven of our, our friends uh, planned on meeting us at this lunch point because we were coming from a place further south, having lunch here, meeting here, and then all paddling back together, kind of like as one big victory party. Um, and we were super touched by this notion and the idea of saying like, maybe due to conditions, we shouldn't do this. Honestly, I didn't really cross my mind. I was so stoked to um, have them join us. And so uh, we had decided the morning before, I, I had a cell phone the entire trip. And just for, for everyone's reference, you can get great 4G even on the most remote parts of the east coast of Taiwan, <laughs> um, unlike my house. And so uh, we had made a plan the night before to meet at this spot. And so uh, it was a little dismaying when we woke up and saw that it was stormier, windier, and the, the conditions were a little bit worse than, we, than had been predicted. Um, but still, we got here a little bit early, and we huddled in a cave until the others started to trickle in. Um, and also to our dismay, as they started to arrive, it became clear that they arrived um, in solo, so they hadn't been paddling together in these conditions. <laughs> um, and the first to arrive was our friend Neo, and lovingly they had brought a cooler full of uh, this, at the time it was a, a seasonal specialty of zongzi, and it's glutinous rice wrapped in bamboo leaves. It's delicious and steamed. And it was, they wanted to ensure the freshness, which we were also incredibly touched by. And so I watched as Neo did a surf landing on, if you see the photo, the sunny photo, on the left side of that rock with a soft cooler 
uh, a pretty large one in his lap and the strap around his neck. And we were just watching him land and with a giant cooler strap around his neck, just being like, no. <laughs> like, and then of course he flips and gets tumbled and we help him and luckily he's not choked by the cooler strap. Uh, and we're just thinking, oh my gosh, what have we gotten ourselves into? Like this is one hell of a way to close this, this trip out. Um, and slowly more people land and the, and the last person to land is our friend Eric. And he is the only person in a composite boat, actually a really light Kevlar boat. And what signal that he should go to the right uh, and go around the outcropping and meet us if you see where that calm slot is. But he interpreted our, our pleas to like go further right and turn around and go around and like hold position, like stop coming in, hold position. He didn't know what those meant. Um, or at the time he didn't register what they meant. And so he thought that that meant get as close to the rock and as close to that cliff as possible as you were coming into land. And as a lot of us know that zone is usually the spiciest <laughs> where the wave steepens and, and harnesses a lot of energy. So it was the most, um, the surf landing that I've witnessed that seared into my mind the most in which he was lifted by a wave vertically against that rock. And then the water withdrew from below him as he was cresting this wave and the boat speared the sand and you could hear this crack as the boat split into two pieces while he was still in it. Um, and you could see it visibly fold. And then he landed upside down in about one foot of water. And oh my oh. God. And so he was fine. He like got up and he, we had to help him get out of the boat because the crack in the boat had impeded his ability to, to extract himself and fully wet exit or dry exit at this point. But um, he was fine. He was shockingly uh, less phased than we were, <laughs> which says a lot in itself. Uh, and then if you go to the next slide, um, you can see we retreated to the cave and you can see a little bit of the, the beach on that day in the background, but it was pretty rainy and dumping rain. So it was hard to begin the repair because a lot of our repair tools uh, required the boat to be dry. So we had to drag it into the cave, try to dry it as best we could, and thank goodness for Nashua tape. <laughs> um, and luckily it wasn't the best repair job, but none of, Kelly and I had VHF radios, but this was a pretty remote part of the coast and all the fishing boats that we could hope for were definitely in the harbor and probably not going to leave. So it was either spend the night in the cave or repair the boat and, and watch Eric enough and make sure the boat didn't sink on the way back enough to make it the six miles home. Um, and luckily the ladder happened and we made it and we had to stop at four different points to pump the water out of his boat that was coming in through the cracks in the tape. Um, but we all made it, hence the photo on the right. <laughs> my hands were so cold I could barely get my fingers up to do double peace signs. But um, we definitely learned a lot that entire trip that came to a head and was really um, clarified uh, on that final day. And so trying to think about leadership, especially in a situation where um, it's not incredibly defined, uh, definitely once we were all together, people looked to me and Kelly to repair the boat and help create a plan to get us back together. But in the lead up, there could have been a lot more preparation, communication, better group decision making, um, and and also some some ways that we all could have primed each other for more success. So, and I, and I think the takeaways are also applicable to 
when we initiate paddles in Basque or even just among our friend group, not just in within Basque. Um, so one is preparation. And I think I see a lot of people doing this really well, but making sure that everyone who could potentially opt in knows what they're getting into. And this isn't always as easy as it sounds because conditions can always change. They can change the day of, despite your, your best efforts at forecasting and, and reading those. But to the best of your ability, if you can front load with as much information about the gear required, the skills required, and also the conditions and what they expect and what kind of skills are required for those conditions, the best, the better off everyone will be. And part of this is taking ownership as an initiator and de facto leader in the in the preparation um, aspect of a paddle in having those tough conversations when somebody shows up you know with a skiing water skiing life jacket <laughs> or you know an inflatable kayak or you know it it's just not equipped for the paddle of the day um, and for what Ashley is saying, use your big girl words and communicate, you know, um, and on and having a mutual understanding of this is coming from a place of compassion and wanting you to be safe rather than asserting my, you know, superiority skills wise, um, and making sure that person understands why and what would help unlock their ability to join in the future. Um, because I think this kind of feedback is, is we seek it and we receive it, whether it's from our friends in the confines of a class, within Basque and paddles, and it's the currency by which we grow our skills. So if everyone can work on getting into the mindset of seeing feedback as like gold um, and really hearing it as that, you can really build your skills and build your reserves with that feedback. Um, and part of it is having the, the gumption to give it, even when it means telling someone they can't put on and they're already at the put in after driving two hours. So communication is another aspect. Clearly what happened in this situation is that um, not only was there like linguistic communication breakdowns, but just paddle signals and making sure everyone understands and is using the same communication tools. Um, I've been on paddles where everyone's like, yeah, yeah, I know paddle signals. And they don't take the time to go over and verify with each other if it's a new group, what those mean to them. And it can compound difficult situations um, and make incidents worse to not have those communication tools you know, validated and on that alignment. Um, the other thing is group decision making. I also see in, in stressful situations, there's a, a group of people who sometimes will band together and maybe have um, a very uh, set idea that the decision has been made, but sometimes doesn't go the extra step to make sure there's understanding with everyone in the group for what the plan is and their role in the plan. So it's not just about group decision making, but also checks for understanding. Um, and, and especially in stressful situations, continued checks for understanding. Um, and the last thing is, is similar to, to what I mentioned when Dale gave his presentation of just thinking of the position of maximum usefulness at all times. Um, and this is something that really became apparent as a cultural contrast. A lot of our students and our friends in Taiwan, there's this, um, ethos of being as helpful as possible and sometimes to a fault where you're you're wanting to help your your friend with their surf landing so much that you forget that you're between the wave and their boat and you completely get stone steamrolled or um not realizing that you're putting yourself in a, in a dangerous situation by trying to be helpful um whereas sometimes i've seen the opposite in a lot of communities here where there's hyper independence, where someone um, stays in the water too long, longer than they should, because someone sees that it's not their responsibility, this person should be able to clean themselves up. Um, so I think there's a happy medium and that's met with 
remembering to be constantly in that position of maximum usefulness, whether that's going for the rescue because you're closest to the rescue, like, you know, positioning yourself in a cave where you could easily zip out to help someone if there's a closeout set and you know where to position yourself. Um, it also could mean knowing that you're getting seasick and communicating that early before you need someone to tow you <laughs> and then <laughs> swim to shore. <laughs> so those are really the, the four key learnings that were crystallized in this experience. So I hope, I'm happy to hear any questions that folks have about it as well or insight. Uh, yeah, I'll turn it over to Dale and Ashley first if you guys have any input from uh, Laura's story or any questions. Well, I do. I, I mean, I think Laura's story is particularly complex because she really didn't have much control over uh, additions to the group. So, you know, the emphasis on planning is, uh, is it's tough to control when you have add-ons throughout the process. But, but I think those are all great takeaways. Ashley? Great. Um, no, I, I didn't have any questions. I, I think, um, I think, I think that we do try to, um, over assist when we're early in assisting, not really understanding where to assist. So, so that is a trial and error balance. I think everybody does that as you're wanting people to have a particular experience you you have a hard time backing out of the experience so i see what you're saying about the the surf and um i've seen that that happen not in taiwan yeah it could happen anywhere anywhere absolutely yeah yeah but, well at this point uh we can open it up to anyone as the webinar to ask questions about uh, what Laura just went over or anything else in general. Um, definitely have the opportunity to think about Q&A right now. But Laura, were you going to add something else? Oh, I, I just saw a question and I think it was answered about the repair tape and it was Nashua aluminum based plumbing tape. Mm -hmm. And plastic bags and electric tape. <laughs> Uh, I've got one question here that was submitted ahead of time that I think could relate to your story pretty well, Laura and Ashley as well. Um, someone had asked, what are some techniques to stay calm in an incident? So, I mean, Laura, as you were telling that story right there, I'm kind of freaking out in my head that someone went vertical and like their boat cracked. And I don't know if there were less experienced people in that group, like if they were kind of getting panicky or freaking out. Um, so I guess does leadership kind of come into play when it's about managing uh, panic with an incident or managing other people's emotions. Does that not always happen? It really depends on the people in your group. Um, I'm curious, Laura, what you might say to that, or Ashley and Dale with your training sessions and scenarios. Um, well, I mean, there's a couple of physiological uh, techniques. One is, is, is control of breathing. And, uh, and the other would be point, point of focus. Uh, so not, not breathing too fast, not uh, focusing too short. Uh, I think there are techniques that I give people for approaching rough water for the first time. Um, I would say um, practice and action. Um, practice rescues in you know, in incrementally more difficult circumstances, practice, practice, practice. And then when you have something happening, you have that action as a physical memory. You're, you know, go, you know, go, you know, grab, you know, you know, the whole thing. So practice, practice, practice. And when there's, when there's, when stuff goes wrong and it does, you're acting, you're, yeah. You're moving to the to make the situation better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People panic less when they have a job to do. Absolutely. And yeah. they know what that is. 
I think that's true. And when, when I think back to the most um, trauma inducing or scariest things that have happened on the water, it, it almost in hindsight, maybe this is just hindsight being 2020. It just feels like there wasn't a choice to panic. Um, and definitely there are ways to physiologically cue yourself to make better decisions or have that practice to make better decisions and have them be muscle memory. But I also think that, especially if you're with a group that knows how to work together to solve the problem, it almost, there's that boom, problem solving mode, you know, no one, like, maybe someone vomits from the blood or like, <laughs> not saying I've been in a situation like that, but uh, I think if you're, if you're really called upon from a, a situation, I'm often surprised at how often people rise to the occasion um and it's it's a it's rarer for me to see someone not demonstrate grace under pressure they may not make the textbook best decision but they don't uh, most people i have seen aren't paralyzed and make the decision worse by not making a decision that's good that's good to hear from your experience um so we will keep it open for questions if anyone wants to submit them via chat, if they can't talk live right now, or we can unmute people to ask their own questions. Uh, Dale and Ashley are on the East Coast, so we are respecting their time, trying not to go too far beyond 710 roughly perhaps, but yeah, any questions? Okay, I have a question have, for um, Laura. Okay, Franca first. Uh, the question for Laura, ahead, you know, uh, yeah, hi. Uh, was uh, the communication? You know, you were trying to use a paddle pad, paddle signal the the person didn't know. Um, in the case, there is very little you can do, right? I found myself in a situation where I was paddling with someone, and uh, uh, our language about paddling was completely different from was from two different point of view. I always looked at the thing from the outside, from the seat and this person was looking at everything from her point of view so there was a constantly misunderstanding where to stand and where to go and um by in your situation uh, you couldn't have uh, helped the person how could you have done how could what different could you have done so one person was actually trying to launch while this was happening, and it was kind of like watching a, a car accident in slow motion, um, because you could see them make the commitment to continue to land, and, and then you just knew it was about to ensue. So as they were coming in, a, a strong paddler was launching from the calm side to try and meet them, but they just blew past our signs of hold position because we were hoping that this person would be able to intercept them and guide them. But like for what you're saying, sometimes the misunderstanding is so great that, you know, this becomes an interpretation of come to us. And that's, um, that's how it went down. But I think if, if we had, um, there are so many interventions, like if we had radios that were working um, and knew that they were on and working, only Kelly and I had radios that the people meeting us didn't. Um, and maybe if we had thought to send this person sooner to intercept, it could have worked, but um, I, it's hard. It's hard when there's, there's that many levels of breakdown in communication. So you almost have to start planning for after the fact, faster than <laughs> diagnosing the communication breakdowns, you know? <laughs> Exactly. Uh, we can go to Jan next. Okay. Um, my um, question or rather comment is directly related to that. Um, and um, in, in essence, my experience is whenever I have the safety talk with a group for a, a paddle with a group um, with people who I don't know, um, I just go through the paddle signals, right? Um, and usually uh, it only takes a couple minutes 
And when you start, you quick, uh, if you look into the faces of those people you don't know, um, you quickly get a feel for, do they have no clue what you're even talking about? Uh, do they look like, what the hell is going on? And then, yeah, then, then, then we can go in, in, in a bit more detail. But just quickly going over the signals um, um, makes a whole lot of sense rather than just uh, going, does everybody know the pa paddle signals? Yeah, everybody's fast to say yes. Same thing with radios. Um, I've gotten into the habit of doing a radio check, even with people I do know, because um, yeah, oftentimes it turns out, oh, I have my radio on, on, on weather bent from the last paddle or um, on, on a totally different ch channel. And then when you need it, um, they, you, you can get them to turn on their radios, but um, on the water, they may not be able to, to uh, switch the channel or something like that. So that little extra time during the safety talk um, oftentimes can save you a lot of time on the water. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with that. Yeah, and I think um, Jonathan in the past has circulated the idea of even a paddle initiator checklist that perhaps includes that so that you're all setting yourselves up for success with making sure you're using the same like paddle signals language and, and symbols. But in this situation, what, what hurt in this incident so much is that he had been our student formally, and these are signals that Kelly and I taught, and there just was a, a drop in recognition. So I think having a plan B to the communication of paddle signals is, um, is essential too. But I think that's a great, great call. Uh, Dale or Ashley, did you have anything to add? To well, you know, I would just say that uh, that paddle signals um, they have some drawbacks. I mean, for instance, the the original signals that were used, I, I think, uh, that came from a John Law video about uh, holding position and then paddling forward and left and right were were done from John on a beach uh, where he had uh, perfect stability on dry land. So. If, you, if your paddle signal requires holding your paddle above your head uh, and you're in strong winds, then you may have to improvise with something else. Uh, and so, I mean, I've experienced situations where, where everybody knew the signals, but weren't able to use that signal. And so confusion ensued because the, you know, the right signal wasn't, wasn't available. Uh, and I found that uh, improvised signals oftentimes work as well if nobody has a set of signals to go by that uh, that improvisation uh, can work you know uh, not everybody agrees with that it doesn't work that way all the time but uh, just to be aware <laughs> that you can't use all signals and not everybody agrees on what these signals are so yeah absolutely um, I think with that, we'll go to one last question uh, with Steve. Uh, so my question has to do with how do you deal with a situation where you see a leadership failure and it's not your group? You're not the leader. You have nothing to do with it. Uh, and this, there was an incident today, actually, where three of us were out paddling. Uh, we were going around Brooks Island. Um, I guess Dale and Ashley, you probably don't know Brooks Island, but it's... Um, it was getting windy. We went around the outside where it gets windier and choppier first because it was going to get worse. And then we were on the inside where it's a little more protected. And we see a commercial group come out of 10 year olds. The average kid looked about 10 year olds in sit inside kayaks without spray skirts, not looking like they know how to paddle. And they're stretched out all over the place and the conditions are getting rough. It was, uh, Oh, at that point, it was almost 20 mile an hour winds that were happening out there, it was peaking. And I think there was one um, so-called guide in the front, some guy in the front, and then the kids were like way strung out where he had no ability to see what was going on with them. And then way far behind them, there was, must have been the other guide uh, who was a um, you know, young woman who was towing two of the little kids. And it just looked like a situation that was extremely hazardous for these kids. So what would you do in a situation like that? I mean, we weren't really sure what to do. 
uh, if they had asked us, if they had gotten, if they had realized they ran over their head and asked us, there were three of us paddling, and asked us to say, accompany them back as kind of extra safeties, we would have done it. But they didn't seem to have a clue that they were even in a dangerous situation. And so what do you do? What would you do in that situation? Mm. So what, can I jump in? Yeah. I, um, what Laura has been saying over and over, position of maximum usefulness. I would hang tight. I would stick with them. I'd stay close. I'd chat them up. Just continue to communicate. And I don't care how long it takes until you get those 10-year-olds. You just paddle alongside them or, you know, hang with them. What did you do? We didn't stay with them. We probably no. should. They're probably fine. <laughs> <laughs> the company and ring them out a bit for what was a terrible decision. Yeah. Uh, so they should know that 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 what I th I have a feeling that uh, the that the so called guides are not experienced guides because they never would have taken ten year olds out in that kind of condition in you know closed deck boats without spray skirts without knowing what they were doing. So I think this company has to be looked at a little more carefully. So I'm, uh, is it Steve? I, I'm reminded of what Ashley said earlier about leadership through service. Um, so you look at what needs to be done and, uh, and go and try and provide that service. And then from what Laura said, with humility, so that you do it uh, so that it's clearly you're not coming from your authoritative self, but coming from uh, your helpful self to, to find a place to, to fit in. And, uh, and oftentimes in those situations, you find out that your help is greatly appreciated. Um, just a comment on the formation, it's uh, lead trail is apt to get strung out like that often. It's not the, the optimum uh, formation for communication uh, and group integrity because what happens is that the you know the better paddlers or the type a uh, group members will stay with the leader and then those who need assistance will fall back and just as you described you know the the trail is is back towing people who need help and and the further they get separated the deeper into six o'clock they are from the leader the less the leader is aware uh, the leader who's surrounded by the, the better paddlers and, and would have to turn, you know, completely around to see. And so, and in that case, it might just be a case of, uh, you know, paddling up to the leader and saying, hey, uh, you know, you probably can't notice from here, but, you know, your, your group is really strung out and your, your assistants back there uh, having to tow a couple of people in trouble. Can we help you in any way? So... Thanks, great points. Thank you, that was really great advice. I hope no one has to see a situation like that again, but I'm sure it'll happen. <laughs> I think with that, we're at 7.15. Uh, we'll move to conclude this Paddling Leadership webinar. Thank you again to our experts in giving us their time, uh, answering our questions. We really appreciate it, you guys. Um, We'll email Buzz with links and reference material included in this presentation. We were recording this webinar, so we're gonna upload that to YouTube and send that out as well. Uh, and once again, we got their websites here. Remember to check on our experts, learn more about them. And if you guys are ever on the East Coast, maybe hit them up and take a lesson. Um, but yeah, any anything else you guys have to, to add, that might be it. Yeah, huge thank you to Pauline and Henry for organizing this. You guys did a ton. Yes, yeah, thanks, you guys. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks. thanks to all of you for uh, allowing us to join in. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time. <laughs>